Uh, joining us live right now on the Harbor One Hotline, our old friend from NBC Sports. Uh, we obviously bring in the heavy hitters when you get into mm. a uh, an elimination game. Here's Catherine Tappen, everybody. Hello, Catherine. <laughs> Hi, guys. How's it going? Good, Catherine. How oh, are you? Oh, great. Backs against the wall. We're doing great <laughs> up here in Boston. Must win. Yeah. Must win. <laughs> I had, a, I had a feeling that was going to be the temperature up there today. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask if you. If the NHL was listening, we would have been fined 50 grand. Put it that way. <laughs> I think you guys talked about it at the end of the first period. You were sitting there amazed that it was a 1-1 game because it was total Bruins domination. I mean, were you shocked at how the game changed dramatically and it changed on three penalties? I wouldn't say shocked because, I mean, this is a really good Islanders team, and I think we expected that, and we've seen that in the entire series, really. So I, don't, I wouldn't say I was shocked. I, didn't, I definitely didn't think it was going to stay 1-1. There's no doubt about that. But, I mean, the three penalties obviously were very controversial, and I think, you know, there's there's no doubt that two of them at least probably shouldn't have been called. But, I listen, I agree with Bruce Cassidy. I don't have any problem whatsoever with his postgame comments. I think he has to say that. And he has to get his team going in that direction. But um, but the, the penalties, I mean, the Islanders are the least penalized team in the entire league during the regular season and the postseason. And I don't think they've scored three power play goals in the playoffs since, what, 2002? <laughs> so, it's, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not common that that happens. I think, obviously, everybody knows there was an issue, and there won't be one on – Thursday night or, yeah, Wednesday night at Nassau Coliseum. But, um, but I mean, I, I can understand why Bruins fans would be upset, and I can understand what happened there. But I think a 1-1 game after the first period, that that, that was not going to stay that way. So, Catherine, I know, uh, listen, our show is not one of these, like, Tuka Rask can't win the game, okay? We think he kind of gets uh, maybe, I don't know, too much criticism. But still, I look at it, and I just don't think he's healthy. And I know it's a tough spot to put the kid, and I know you guys talk about it a little bit there as well. But what do you, what do you think they do? If, this, yeah. if he's not healthy... Do you put the kid in a tough spot on the road, Swayman, in game six? No, no. And to be honest, I don't think any player on the ice right now is probably healthy at 100%. I mean, these are, these are the playoffs, and this is exactly how they operate. But Tuca, I mean, he's not going into that game last night if he's not ready to play. And he obviously, going to morning skate, I know that he didn't skate with the team yesterday morning, and there were some question marks. And, yeah, he's definitely banged up. We know that. But it's not that he can't play the game. And I think, you know, it was the right decision to make a switch. Jeremy Swayman's a great goalie. I mean, this kid, you know, he's proven himself. He proved himself at the end of the regular season that he can play. I have no problem if he has to play tomorrow night. And I don't think Bruins fans should. But I, I don't I don't think that Bruce Cassidy or Tuka Rask would have put themselves in that game. He would have put himself in that game if there was a significant issue. Um, and I'm a huge Tuka Rask fan. I think, you know, he gets some unnecessary criticism at times, even dating back to last season, the playoffs, leaving the bubble. Um, I just think that this is your number one guy. He's a, you know, he's, he's, he's the guy that you've got to put in net, and he's going to probably start tomorrow night. I hope he does. I think he deserves to start if he's even feeling 90%. I mean, Tuka Rask at 90 or 80% is better than Jeremy Swayman in net as a, as a rookie netminder going into an elimination game six. So, um, I don't. I, I think also Bruce Cassidy making the switch at the time he did was a spark for his team as well. He he needed to make that change at the time when he made it. Whether Tuker was saying he wanted out or they just needed to get some kind of change for the team to get them going last night. You know, Catherine. Um, you know this whole the the, the 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 chirping back and forth between Trots and Cassidy. I mean, it's it was fun, in, you know, in the beginning. But I don't know whatever type of advantage Cassidy is trying to get. It's not working. It's actually backfiring on him. I just I wonder like what your thoughts are on the I guess the 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 uh, the ability and the the willingness just to be really open and honest with the reporters when they ask him questions. And do you think he should just keep his mouth shut? So are you talking about last night's comments with the officiating? Last night's and the night before the and game and game yeah. four. Yeah, but generally, yeah, it's been it was bad. It wasn't bad. It was great for us. We loved it. But then it's like, all right, listen, this isn't working, right? You should probably keep your mouth shut. You're not getting the calls from the refs. I, th I listen. I think you know we've seen this from Cassidy over the years, though. He's definitely not one to shy away from what he feels. And I I had no problem. I said it before. We had all three of us on set last night. You know, Patrick Sharp, three Stanley Cups, Anson Carter played years in the league, like none of them had an issue with his post-game comments. He has to say that because the team's not going to say that. You're not going to hear Patrice Bergeron saying that to the reporters after the game. But um, it's his personality. It's what we've It's what you've grown to love. And the team responds to that. His team, 
I, I think I disagree with you there, Christian, about the you know the team not responding to it. I think they actually do. Um, that team. No, I'm not saying that the team doesn't respond. I, I'm saying that the refs. <laughs> he's, he's not. The refs. They hold it against well, them. The refs aren't. It's like the ref, if, Yeah, it feels like the refs are holding it against them. It's not. They're not. They're not. They're not paying it forward. They're actually penalizing him more. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I mean, there is an integrity to the league that they have to uphold. But I think, I think in general, listen, it was a, it was clearly a lopsided, penalized game last night. I I don't anticipate that happening tomorrow night. And actually, you might see some calls go in the Bruins' way. By the way, though, you know, you look at Richie and that pe- that should have been a penalty. He gets a five thousand dollar fine today. That would have been a penalty last night if it wasn't for you know, a ref overlooking that. So it go it went both ways last night. It wasn't all entirely pro Islanders. Um I, I you know, I know that Cassidy said there's whatever a love affair for the Islanders right now, but I think that these officials are not they're the best at the game at this point in time in the postseason. They're gonna miss things and they're gonna call things. And uh and I just don't think it'll be as lopsided tomorrow night. We're talking to Catherine Tappan from uh, NBC Sports. So you talked about the Islanders being a really good team, and I totally agree with you. It seems to me the big difference is the Bruins totally rely on the first line, maybe a little bit on their second line, especially after you know they uh, added guys in the trade. The Islanders, on the other hand, are four lines deep, and last night their third and fourth line came up big when they needed it. Is that fair to say that that's why they're relentless, because they can go four lines deep? Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, the Islanders' fourth line has always been one of their biggest identity lines. You guys think back to when the Bruins won the Cup in 2011, and they had, you know, their fourth line was was Sean Thornton. It was, you know, Gregory Campbell was on that line. I remember Brad Marchand had started on that line at the start of that season. So I, I feel like that is what you're seeing with the New York Islanders, and they do have a more balanced attack. There's no question. I mean, Boston also has a depleted defense right now. You don't have Brandon Carlo. You don't have Kevin Miller. Um, those are significant losses for the Bruins defense core and I I think that when you can roll four lines and you're missing defensemen it's a bad combination for Boston but this Islanders team is deep they're well balanced that being said I think the Bruins perfection line and that second line is probably as dangerous with just two as it is for four for the Islanders so um, you know last night I think they had the advantage with with final change tomorrow night's going to probably be a bigger issue for the Bruins without that opportunity to do that well first off Catherine I know you loved uh, Pasternak suit correct I mean, the, oh my God, that was unbelievable! <laughs> Wait, can I can I just say that I like love him as a player? I oh, think yeah. he should be front front and center, face of the league. We did an unbelievable shoot with him, like I don't know, this was two months ago, probably. He's just personality, and he loves the game, and he comes out and he backed up that suit with the opening goal. What a minute and twenty five <laughs> seconds in, mm. it was. Great. Yeah, yeah hat trick. Yeah, earlier in the postseason, we whipped out another great suit too. Oh. So maybe he's got to go with the funky oh, suits. Print but on it. The difference oh, that bring something out. that line <laughs> was. Uh, it almost looks like they're on a power play twenty four seven when they play when they get going. Marchand's unbelievable, but how much does it change when you go to New York? You know, it looks like that that last change. You know, Trotz is able to kind of, I don't know, neutralize them a little bit. We saw that in Game 3 and Game 4, even though they won Game 3. But it seems like, oh, oh, 4 and 5, rather, whatever it was. But all the difference in the world. Yeah, well, they have the matchups. That's, that's the that's the advantage of, you know, having that final change on home ice. So I think, you know, the I, I did I did like what I saw out of that perfection line, though, in, in uh, last, what was it, Game 5 in New York, Game 4. Losing yeah. track of these games right now. I'm with you. I did the same <laughs> um, thing. You know, it, yeah, they all rolled together. But I think the you know the professional line was able to find a way to get past you know to work with the Islanders, and they looked good in that game. And I think you're going to see that again tomorrow night. I mean, they're so good. They're they're to me the best line in hockey. I think, and um, I think that tomorrow night you'll, you'll see a different team out there. I mean, they know it's an elimination game. The Bruins are good in elimination games, and they're very they're way more experienced than that Islanders team is. So. Um, I think it'll be exciting. I think the Islanders will be nervous in that Coliseum. They're going to want to win that game. So, well, what about what about the the Holland Goats line? Ooh, <laughs> we, we, listen, you got to give her some background. Give her some. Well, we're talking it, about. It has, I thought it took. Well, you I got the know, fire. Well, you got the thought, you know, the perfection line. You had the identity line. So we're trying to come up with something with that second line for the Bruins. And Christian came up with Holland Goats. We've been playing Holland Goats now Holland for two Goats? days. Yeah, I don't know. Oh yes. my gosh, Talk that's to him. funny. I was Squint. like, I don't have, I don't have that one. <laughs> I don't, you should I don't use know that, that one. one. When you, do, well, you, 
The next time, listen, game six. Let's go. Makes no Throw sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My Babcock called the, uh, the – he's been calling that line that uh, Lou Lamarillo traded for Kyle Palmieri and Travis Dajak, and he called it the deadline the other night. So we've been, <laughs> oh, we've that's been a good using one. that as the Islanders. But that's a good one. I, I, like yours. I like yours. I may have to leave that in tomorrow night. We'll have to yes. see. <laughs> yes. I mean, they, don't you think they yeah. deserve some recognition? You, everybody's got these cool nicknames, right, if you establish yourself as, like, you know, being pretty good. So the Holly Goats line, like I feel like it needs to like, catch fire. I do. I I'll go with it. Oh no! <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh, oh yes! I might lose my job, but it's okay. No, you won't. You'll get a raise. Uh, you're, you're you'll upset. get a raise. Don't worry. Christian will lose his, but you you'll be just yeah, uh, for fine. The third time. I'll slide into Christian's spot. Like yeah, it. we had fun. Pierre Maguire on the other day, and obviously he's in between the glass down there. But he talked about the difference of games now with crowds and you guys were talking about it last night and talking about it the other night at the Nassau Coliseum. I think you made some mention. Wait till they go to the the uh, TD Garden or whatever. I'm wondering you're I back did. in did you did you feel the love? See? I yeah, give did. Boston a I lot heard of love it. up there. I heard it. So you're back in the studio, but you tell me when you go to a live shot, when you go to like for an example, uh Montreal and Winnipeg where they have like twelve people in the stands or whatever, oh. there seems to be a, a real difference. Uh, it, do you think it changes everything in, in the game, the crowd? Oh, back. 100%. Yeah. I mean, you guys, we had that Montreal-Winnipeg series, and it ended last night, and I, I was rather happy it did. It, it's really hard to watch, and yeah. I feel badly for those players because they're playing in those conditions, and I can't wait to see Montreal go to either Vegas or Colorado because I think they're going to be energized and electrified just, just being in that atmosphere. Even though the fans are cheering for the other team, I just think that energy is is it's so lacking in that North division. And there's no doubt that these guys, we're seeing a different brand of hockey than we did during the regular season when fans were not allowed. I mean, when the TD Garden started allowing fans to come back, what did they start with? Maybe a couple thousand or, or so. And even that got 12%, the players used. Yeah. yeah, but that even that small percentage um, made a difference. And we saw with the Montreal series this last round when they allowed, they were the first team in the North to allow about 2,500 fans. And, even those few fans made such a difference. You could hear them last night when they won, which was awesome. Um, they were so loud, and they were cheering for the Habs, which has just been an improbable run for them. But I think that there's no doubt that the fans have made a difference. It's it's amped up our playoff atmosphere, the coverage, what the players are doing on the ice. I think it's great. I'm so excited they're back. It's not been fun covering sports mm. without them. And, um, I mean, you guys know this, and we feel it even just in the studio, not being on site. We'll be on site for probably next round and the final round. But it's it's been totally different just sitting back and watching the games. And when you have them side by side, you've got Montreal and Winnipeg, and then Boston and the Islanders. I mean, it's it's like watching two separate leagues. So I'm really excited that we're going to see this great game tomorrow at Nassau Coliseum. Hopefully, it goes back to Boston for Game Seven. And the fan bases have been a real difference maker in these series. So that's what I was going to ask you. You think they will have a game seven? You mentioned it. Down down three to I two. Do. They've had a good good run here in the past. I do. Yeah, they absolutely. You know, 2019 against Toronto, 2011 against Vancouver. And, yeah, I do. I think this series, we've said it from day one that this series is going seven games. And I think that one out west is going to go seven, two with Colorado and Vegas. Um, you know, you've got unbelievable teams. It's a shame that one of these teams in, in this division and out west as well is going to have to go home after this round. But, um I do think it goes back. I think Boston comes out real strong tomorrow. I think they're, they're going to have a little chip on their shoulder. They've got, they've got every reason to want to bring this series back to Boston. And if they do, I, I have a hard time thinking the Islanders would win that Game 7 at TD Garden. Catherine, it's always great talking to you. Thanks for checking in you with us. We appreciate guys. it. Sneak Thanks, it in Catherine. there. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hall, yeah, calling goats. Now. Calling goats. <laughs> Talk to me. Let's go. Don't, <laughs> Catherine, don't, don't let them embarrass you. Don't let them do that. Oh, my gosh. You guys they are the best. Thanks for having See me you, on, Catherine. guys. Bye-bye. Catherine, Catherine Tappan from NBC Sports on the Harbor. 